Francis Kokosalaki, Anthony, Steli, and friends, and greetings. Thank you so much for having us here. I'd like to speak <clears throat> in recognition of our love and admiration for Sophia, what she means to us in London, and what she means to me personally. Like Ariadne, I'll try to feel my way through the threads of our memories of her, which go right back to the turn of the millennium. I see so many people here, all her amazing posse of Greek creative friends in London. <laughs> Us mere journalists, stylists, retailers, sponsors, people who studied with, with Sophia, who taught her. Um, and the women who went out and had the time of your lives in her clothes. Right? <laughs> Some who got married in her and went to each other's weddings in her. And you'll see uh, some of her clothes next door, which Harriet, which are Harriet's, which is some of the most important things, uh, clothes that she ever made. What I'd like to speak about is getting to know Sophia <clears throat> and being completely captivated by her Cretan modern identity, right from the beginning. In 2001, I was editing my own magazine, The Fashion, which Melanie's has spent. <laughs> Hold up, that was it. This is, this is an ancient document now, which is worth a lot of money. It's from 2002. Um, Sophia had, had recently uh, graduated from St. Martin's MA and showed a second collection, which completely blew me away because I recognised it. Her Cretan references, the way the colour of these clothes was exactly like the baked clay and glass from the Palace of Knossos, the wildness of it. It really meant something to me because the first place I ever went to, to abroad was Crete when I was 11 years old. Because my mother Celia taught ancient civilization as well as art. And she gave me books to read about Theseus and the Minotaur and, the, and all the Greek legends. And then Mary uh, Renault's novel, uh, The King Must Die, which is about uh, Theseus. And then this is her book, <laughs> Leonard Cottrell's. Um, the Bull of Minos, about Sir Arthur Evans Dig and the archaeology of which was a bit dodgy back now. <coughs> so we went to Knossos and got completely swept up in Minoan art and imagining goddesses and priestesses and ladies of the court and the bull dancers and the rituals and it all seemed completely alive and real to me. Anyway, suddenly here amongst us in London was this astonishing apparition of a Greek girl talking about all this. <laughs> in a really exciting, non-academic, yet viscerally informed fashion way. Well, actually, I mean her shy and self-facing, <laughs> but completely certain way. And looking like a tall, cool, blonde Greek goddess in a black leather jacket, by the way, with legs forever. So just because I could, because I was an editor, in the summer of 2001, I asked Sophia to go off to Crete and direct a sort of documentary about her island, and so I sent her off with a photographer. Have a look at page. <laughs> Melanie owns most of the Sophia's dresses, by the way, and she's one of those good time Sophia girls. <laughs> about to say, um, I sent her off with a photographer, Serge, Serge Le Blanc, and a model, and her clothes with probably a hundred pounds, and just said, come back with an eight-page story for me. And I wrote a feature about her, and what she got up to, which I'll read to you in a minute. But first of all, it's very important to remember what the times were like when Sophia first appeared. You have to remember that in 2001, these were dark days for London Fashion Week. <laughs> they were. They were also dark days for the world because 9-11 was about that very year. Um, in this in this issue, I also wrote about the impact on fashion creativity um, of 9-11 and really this was happening just then. Uh, not only that, London was in trouble. Already, John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, Hussein Jalaya, and Selma McCartney had all defected to show in Paris. 
the BMC, just let us say, was not what it was today. It was one man and a sort of one-eyed dog and some, <laughs> and some high street men circling it. <clears throat> so the lights were going out in London. That's what it felt like. But Sophia's Tokosalaki heralded the coming of the light for this city. She was the beginning, the forerunner, really one of the first London designers who a new network of young allies rallied around, mostly women, all women, I would say. There were Jane Shepherdson and Karen Downey at Topshop, who were also doing what they did by following their instincts despite the uh, suits, who commissioned Sophia to do one of the earliest uh, signed collaborations at Topshop. That's right, isn't it, Jane? I'd also been co-opted to the BFC New Jane Committee as a sort of satellite person they didn't really want to deal with. And I was yapping at them to say, they better get on and start looking out for new talent, like Sophia, because the old ones weren't coming back. I mean, they never did, did they? Then one day I was sitting at my desk at the fashion when the phone rang. We had desks, so we had the phones on desks then. And it was someone called Joy Yappe saying, Do you know who Sophia Pocus like he is? You've got to know. She's so great at leather. And I'm going to give you the scoop, Sarah. She's taking over Rupert Rufo Research. <laughs> well, that was, a, that was a big deal. Joy had great instincts too, and here she was rolling the dice in favour of Sophia Kokoslaki for the gig at the Milanese Leather Company. It was a big deal, because Sophia was a designer who was following on from A.F. van der Voorst and Raph Simmons and Veronique Ranquino. The coolest of the late 90s Belgian cool. But Sophia was a London designer, and a Greek, and a woman. We were proud. So there we were on September the 9th, 2001, absorbing the cataclysmic shock and panic of seeing planes flying into the Twin Towers. Yet looking at Sophia's work, speaking as it did about ancient civilization felt somehow like a counterbalance to me, a kind of philosophical Greek way of putting things in perspective in a very, very long view, as Greeks will do. That really is a wisdom, coupled with the ironic view and wit that Sophia carried with her at all times. Her shrug and her laugh and the hum uh, understanding of the human way that we all carry on. She knew how to live in the present and she deeply understood the, the past as well. So, um, which I want, I want to go into what she told me about, about this journey she preached and how profound that was. Um, this, at this show, at the end of the show, she just managed to say it was Cretan, pagan. And then she bolted from the backstage scene while everyone else was standing around raving because she was like that. She didn't like the light, did she? Um, but I managed to nail her down for this piece. She told me in depth how she spent all her summers in Crete up until the age of 13 when I wasn't having any more. <laughs> but she said, now I'm older, I feel a closeness to this place. It's a wild, almost aggressive landscape with lots of mountains and small villages where people keep to tradition, traditions, and she loved the traditions. One thing that really sticks in my mind is what she told me about this di the distinction between Greeks and Cretans. This is what she said. I've never known anywhere so devoted to the idea of a mother country. For the people of Crete, that means Crete, not Greece. Whereas Greeks talk about their fatherland, these people in Crete will Crete their motherland. So Sophia took her model and cruised Hania in the northwest of Crete, where she spent her long afternoons with her grandmother. She told me there was no Western entertainment, television, videos, or anything. So what can you do other than swimming? Craft. My grandmother taught me macrame and ajure. I don't know what that ajure is, but I think it might be the piping of the leather. Anybody know? It is. Thanks. <clears throat> and she said, that really helps me. So I described seeing the material and cultural resonances in this collection, particularly, particularly the high-waisted plastic-colored cheesecloth dress with the heat keyhole of the recorded leather. The one in the middle, which is over there as well. Um, emblematic of both folk costume and the colors and shapes of ancient Minoan civilization. Sophia said it was very 
it was 3000 BC, but very advanced. It was a society which adored women. You can see that clearly in the paintings. These incredible priestess, priestesses and athletes with uncovered breasts and tight bodices and enormous skirts that would almost be of today. So, off they went to the court of King Minos and shot around Knossos. <laughs> when the pictures came back, as you might be able to see, they were blurry. And I can tell you, I was pretty put out. The art director rushed over and assured me that it was a photographer's style, you know, edgy, um, photo edgy photography of the 2000s. Do you remember this? <laughs> but then I suspect what, what really, what Sophia really got up to in Canossa's was that she was there without a permit. Because it would have taken quite a lot to get a permit. <laughs> and I don't know whether you even can to shoot there. And it was her way of getting around it, not to be too specific. So is there... Yes, there we are. Generally indicating that she was in Canossa. <laughs> Never daunted by any problem, that was Sophia Kokosalaki. Um, I mean, when this was published, I was afraid I was going to get a call from the Greek embassy and <laughs> with a demand to pulp the, uh, the issue uh, before it came out, but thank God that didn't happen. There was more. Sophia told me more about the matrilineal life of her, in her family, the power of it. She told me about her great-great-grandmother. She was a kind of a saint, she told me, who built a monastery up in the hills to shelter sick and poor people. And I think this is, this is her monument here. She also vividly described to me the proud character of Cretan village people. They're rough, but rough in an elegant way. They'll kill themselves to welcome you, even if they have no money. And then, I need the next slide. And then she kept referring to Cretan we we menswear in her shows. You might forget that she did so much menswear right from the beginning. Um, and you can see what she meant when she started to tell me this. It's a waistcoat, loose trousers, flat boots, a cummerbund, and all in black. I think it's amazing and kind of sexy. And how often can you say that about folk costume? It's a bit 70s even. Rock in a primitive way. She still love her rock. <laughs> Finally, I asked, do you know what really matters to you as a, as a designer, Sophia? Um, where, where, where does your background and, uh, uh, and your past come into focus in your, in your fashion? She said to me, I'm very interested in craftsmanship, yes. But my ideal state is to have handwork on a garment which is contemporary. What's the point of having an amazing technical detail if somehow it isn't cool? <laughs> and I especially love this part of what she said. Dressing women, I try not to humiliate the wearer. As a woman, you don't want to look like you're trying too hard. I really don't think there's anything worse. And how true is that? When Alexander McQueen came to her next show, I reported that on Star.com. I reported it on Star.com. That this show was so mobbed that he had to barge his way to get into the front row. Alexander McQueen, it's true, right? <laughs> Alexander McQueen didn't go out, didn't like people, but he, he was there because of the respect and the admiration that she already had from people, not just as a designer, but because of her character. And I can't stop looking at how amazing that show was. And again, very modern Cretan, just incredible. I concluded this piece by, by asserting just how special Sophia Pocasolaki's acclaim was to us in London. Her unique talent for strong, beautifully feminine clothes was setting her and us in London on an international footing. Though so young, I said, she is almost one of the most mature designers in this city already recognised as somebody with a fully formed aesthetic integrity, a leader rather than a follower. That was the so lucky, a woman of integrity, talent and profound beauty. Who we thank and remember in our hearts 